Hey everyone, my name is Courtney and welcome back to my channel. I am here with my Liquid Courage as always and in this video today we are going to be reading some aquatic themed horror. If this sounds like a random choice, that's because it is. In all seriousness though, my family and I, we just moved from Chicago to a Detroit suburb called St. Clair Shores. And this is a very water focused community. Lots of sailing taking place, lots of people with boats, very aquatic in nature. And so to celebrate that and the fact that I now have a bathtub for the first time in five and a half years, I thought that this would be a great opportunity to read horror books that are centered or focused around the water. I personally have always been kind of freaked out by the water. You just never know like what's lurking under the surface, especially the ocean is so deep. There's so many creatures that we don't even know that much about. It's very creepy. Shipwrecks, super creepy. And I just really want to read some books in the bathtub and be freaked out about the water even more. In this video, we are going to be talking about A House at the Bottom of a Lake by Josh Mallerman. This is a shorter novella sort of book. And we're starting with two young kids. They're 17 years old. They're on a first date. They are enjoying some time on the water. And on their date, they discover a house at the bottom of a lake. As they're investigating this house, they find it really seems like the laws of nature and physics do not exist down there. This is a house that they can make totally their own and they can breathe underwater. And it's just really a place for the two of them only. But then the longer they stay, the more dangerous it becomes. They might be losing their sanity a little bit. I have only read Bird Box by Josh Mallerman and he keeps cranking out books. I feel like he's becoming one of those really prolific writers like Stephen King and Adam Neville and I am really excited to read some more of his work. He is also a Michigander. The next book that we are going to be reading in this video is The Deep by Alma Katsu. I have heard really great things about Alma Katsu, specifically her book The Hunger, which is about the Donner Party. And this is about another favorite historical event of mine, which is the Titanic. In this, we are following a woman named Annie. She has spent the last few years of her life in an asylum and she was entered into the asylum after surviving the sinking of the Titanic. She knows that she's not truly insane and she doesn't really associate herself with the other people in this asylum. However, she really has nowhere else to go. And then she gets a letter from a friend of hers who is also on the Titanic and her friend is setting out on the Britannic, which is the sister ship to the Titanic. And it was a luxury ocean liner turned war hospital on the ocean, basically. And her friend is begging Annie to join her on the Britannic and become a nurse with her and take care of these wounded soldiers. On board the Britannic, Annie meets a man named Mark, who she had also known on the Titanic. And as they reconnect, Annie, she sort of blocked out the memories of that night that the Titanic sank, but reconnecting with all of these old friends of hers, she has a lot of memories bubbling up to the surface, and she has a feeling that it wasn't all just natural occurrences that brought the Titanic down. She thinks that there might have been some supernatural disturbances at play that really impacted what happened to the ship. Sounds like it's going to be speculative, sounds like it's going to be a little haunted. I am always looking for some good Titanic content, but I will say that I am very picky. I have consumed so much Titanic content in my life. I became fully obsessed when I was very young after the movie came out, of course, but also when I found out that it had sank on my birthday, April 15th, it was a full-blown obsession for me for the longest time. Since I have consumed so much Titanic content though, I'm really hoping for something a little bit different. I am also really hoping for some good 
you know, day in the life on board the Titanic sort of stuff from the perspective of somebody who was actually on it and survived. The cover itself, very creepy. I hope you can see it with the reflection coming from the window, but we've got the Titanic with this very ghostly body beneath the surface. I really hope that I like this one. It's very long though, and the reviews are very mixed on Goodreads and Storygraph. And actually not even mixed, they're quite low, like in the low three star rating. So I'm a little nervous, but we're gonna give it a shot. I think that historical fiction as a whole is kind of divisive. Everybody wants something different from it, so we shall see. And the last book that we are going to be talking about is The Deep by Nick Cutter. And we are actually just going to dive right into this one because I've already finished it. I started this book a couple of weeks ago when I got it from the library, and this was another very thick book, so I really just wanted to dive right in. I have never read Nick Cutter before. I know that the troupe is very popular from him, but I expressly sought this book out first to fit the water vibes we've got going on here. Even though this book is long, it's right about 400 pages. It doesn't feel that long at all. We are following Luke. He is a veterinarian living in a world where there's a pandemic, basically giving everybody Alzheimer's at the same time. Everybody starts getting these telltale spots all over their body and that is really the marker of this disease. And then they might start forgetting what they had for dinner yesterday. They might forget where they put their car keys and then it rapidly advances to where they are forgetting how to breathe and feed themselves and perform basic personal hygiene tasks. Luke does not have the disease, but he is really isolated in the world. His wife has left him after the disappearance of their young son. So he is very surprised when he is contacted by the government and they had received a recording from his brother a few days ago basically begging him to come and see him. And the message that he has from his brother is extremely creepy. It's like, Luke, come home. We need you. And Luke is like, we? Who's we at the bottom of the ocean? Because that is where his brother is. He is at the bottom of the Mariana Trench, eight miles below the surface of the ocean. And he is researching this gelatinous, material that they have discovered that they are calling ambrosia and they think that this ambrosia is possibly the cure for this alzheimer's like disease that they're calling the gets kind of a dumb name but this ambrosia could also be the cure for a lot of other diseases plaguing the earth as well after this transmission from luke's brother comes to the surface the research lab at the bottom of the ocean has become radio silent and one of the three scientists somehow shot himself up to the surface in one of their submarines he was dead and the wounds on his body were just super grotesque so now they are concerned about Luke's brother Clayton as well as the second scientist that is on board. From there, it's a ride. Luke goes down to the bottom of the ocean to this research lab. He is accompanied by a military woman named Alice. She goes by Al and she's warning Luke the whole way down about how quickly and easily people can go insane and as soon as they get to the underwater research lab it becomes very apparent to luke extremely quickly that shit ain't right it is not right down there nick cutter does such an excellent job in this book creating tension dread every single time something pops up i was reading the book like <gasps> Like, I do not gasp at books, and then every time something happened, I was shook. I know that Nick Cutter is very well known for his disturbing, overly descriptive, gory, body horror sequences, and after reading The Deep, I really believe that this is his claim to fame. There are so many moments in this book that are literally burned into my brain, as much as I wish they weren't because of how just gross and detailed 
and just uniquely awful <laughs> they were. This book will have you never looking at bees the same way again. It will have you never looking at guinea pigs the same way again. It will even have you looking a little sideways at your dog because of the things that are happening in this book. I also see Stephen King recommending Nick Cutter's work a lot. He's actually blurbed on the front of this book talking about the troupe, but I think in general Stephen King is a Cutter fan. And I think you can see why. Nick Cutter definitely is a Stephen King stan. There's no doubt about it. Some of the dialogue is very Stephen King-esque for better and for worse. I It is part of the reason why this book was only a four out of five star for me. Just some of the dialogue was a little bit awkward. Every time Luke and his brother Clayton are interacting with each other, they start throwing in these weird names for each other. Or they'll be like, dear brother, is that really what you think? Or you think you're so smart, dear brother of mine. It was just like, so weird like nobody talks that way out loud but it very much reminded me of stephen king some people are also comparing this book to the shining i think that is because of the isolation element and also the fact that our main character in isolation is losing his grip on reality but i would say that this is very similar to it as well the longer that luke is staying in this underwater research lab the more he starts to lose grip on reality and he is being haunted by this very Pennywise-esque entity and it changes forms in the way that it's tormenting him. He is triggered by this entity in one way and Al, he can tell, is also being haunted by this entity as well but in a completely different way based on her own circumstances. Man, I just really enjoyed this book very thoroughly. It really had me hearing the new creaks and groans in my house a little bit differently at night. Just really got under my skin and especially as we start to get to some of the more body horror focused aspects of the book. <sighs> If you are looking for water themed horror or really just horror in general as we are moving into October, this is definitely a great book to read. Do not let the length deter you. You'll be just sucked right in and just really held into this pressure cooker situation that he's created in this book. Alrighty, now I'm going to dive into the deep very confusing to read two books called The Deep in one video, but I'm going to dive into this one and I will check back in with you guys tomorrow. Bye. Well, like the ship that this book is based on, my excitement has sunk. I have to DNF this one. I think I got to about page 64 and already I was telling myself just make it to page 100 before you decide if you want to DNF it. Just make it to page 100. Just make it to page 100. And I ended up being pretty busy the last couple of days and I really haven't had an opportunity to read that much. And just the idea of picking this book up felt like such a burden. I don't even think I could have brought myself to make it to page 100. And so it's gotta go. So far, I had been following Annie. She is the main character that I had pretty much given a rundown of in the beginning of this video where she was in an asylum post surviving the sinking of the Titanic. And she receives a letter from a friend of hers asking her to come work with her on the Titanic sister ship, the Britannic. Annie thinks this is a great idea. She loves the water. And even though everything that happened with the Titanic happened, she doesn't feel deterred from getting on board another massive ocean liner. And she gets to the Britannic. She's getting a crash course in nursing and learning how to care for wounded soldiers. And we are also getting flashbacks of when she was going on board the Titanic for the first time. We have the parallel of her entering the Britannic and her entering the Titanic. On the Titanic, she was working as a maid. And there are just a few things already happening in 60 pages 
that really made me feel I couldn't deal with another 350 pages of this. This book is over 400 pages, right? So it's a pretty big time commitment. And for starters, it is already extremely repetitive. In the letter that her friend writes to her begging her to come on board the Britannic, she's describing the ship. You know, we have this grand staircase, but there's not any of the luxuries that were on the Titanic, or it's hard to believe that this was a luxurious ship, and now it's this hospital on the water, basically. She is giving all of these descriptions of the differences. And then we go into the point of view of the captain of the Britannic, and he is giving pretty much the same descriptions. We've got the grand staircase, we've got this, this, almost the exact same descriptions of the boat, but from a different POV. And then Annie gets on board the Britannic, and guess what? She's noticing the staircase. She's noticing the exact same differences between the Titanic and the Britannic and how the luxurious amenities are now a lot more sterile and for the purpose of taking care of soldiers. And so right in a row, we get three descriptions of the ship that are literally the same. The writing is just also not doing anything special for me. It's very basic, very plain, but then there's these just really weird similes and metaphors sprinkled in and that's what adds like the spice to the writing. Annie is also just really hard to get into as a character. On board the Titanic she becomes obsessed with this family and their baby and for some reason she's like obsessed with this baby and like wants to hold it and look at it and like all of this stuff and I'm sure there's a reason, but I just don't care at this point to find out what that reason is. Also, about 65 pages in, we haven't seen any of the paranormal or supernatural stuff come into play yet. We've spent a lot of time now bouncing between characters that I just don't care about. So for that reason, I am out. We are going to send this one out to sea, back to the library. And we are going to be moving on to the house at the bottom of the lake. Alrighty, I have finished A House at the Bottom of the Lake by Josh Mallerman. And I have so many thoughts for such a short little novella. First of all, I would really truly hesitate to call this a horror book. There are definitely some creepy elements here, but it's not pervasive enough throughout the entire book. It didn't really give me that sense of dread that I would be hoping for from a horror novella and I was not truly scared the entire time. So in this one, we are following James and Amelia. They are two 17 year olds who are going out on a date together. They have James's uncle's canoe and he knows of some scenic spots on a lake to look at some mountains, have a picnic and just have a fun time together. While they are canoeing, they discover a tunnel that leads them to a third lake which was unbeknownst to James and when they look under their canoe they see a fully built house at the bottom of the lake. They are stunned by this discovery, they can't believe it, it seems too weird to be true and then they start taking turns diving to the house holding their breath for as long as they can to investigate and they're seeing that there's windows and it's fully furnished and nothing is floating. Everything seems really rooted in place there and they become really obsessed with this house. They keep going back time and time again. They cannot breathe underwater like I had previously thought, but they do come with like diving suits, scuba gear, so that they can spend longer and longer in this house. And that's kind of it. The eeriest part is sort of this obsession that James and Amelia develop regarding this house. 
there is some spooky imagery as they're investigating. But I think the biggest problem with this novella is that Josh Mallerman does a lot of telling instead of showing. So we think it's weird because they're like, a house at the bottom of the lake. A house at the bottom of the lake. And they like repeat themselves a lot. And along with just being told how odd this house at the bottom of the lake is, I felt zero attachment to James and Amelia whatsoever. We are told that they're falling in love. However, all of their conversations revolve around the house, going back to the house, the magic of it, how obsessed they are with it. So when they start falling in love with each other, I really didn't buy it. I did enjoy reading this for the most part. The writing is very simple, easy to follow. And it was a cool idea. And I think that that's really what Josh Mallerman had was this cool idea. And he's from Michigan, I'm from Michigan. I've spent a lot of times on lakes growing up and it's not uncommon to see sunken boats or rafts or any number of objects at the bottom of a lake. And so I would not be surprised if like me, he's seen stuff and just sort of let his imagination run wild. Instead of seeing a boat at the bottom of the lake, what if it was a house? Okay, who's discovering this house? And I think he, it really snowballed from there, but it just wasn't concrete enough. I didn't feel enough. There wasn't enough terror or dread. I think even in moments where they're holding their breath and investigating the house, I didn't feel that fear of like, I, what if I don't get to the surface in time? Where as in The Deep by Nick Cutter, we are constantly aware of how dangerous the water is, what's lurking out there, what the consequences would be if their air supply is cut off. And so that is something that this book really shined at that this book did not. I gave this one a three out of five stars. I'm definitely not cutting off Josh Mallerman for life or anything. This just really didn't fit that watery horror vibe that I was looking for. Definitely lots of water, just not a lot of horror. And that's it, my friends. We have come to the end of this video. Kind of a flop, TBH. It was, um, you know, we had one major hit, one sort of mid, and then one fail. I don't think that my ranking of these three books is any surprise whatsoever, but my least favorite was The Deep by Amakatsu. This was my DNF. Very repetitive. Could not have imagined going through 450 pages of this. House at the Bottom of the Lake was my middle pick. It was just fine. Not scary, but fine. And my number one pick was The Deep by Nick Cutter. And this is a book that I'm actually very glad that I picked up. I think without this video idea, I probably would have read The Troop first. And this one might not have even been one that I picked up ever, but I'm so glad that I read it. It genuinely scared me and it really just made me even more excited to read The Troop and more of Nick Cutter's books. Thank you guys so much for coming on this journey into the underwater unknown with me. If you are new here, please be sure to subscribe. We have a September wrap up coming up. We have spooky October reads. I think I'm going to be vlogging every week in the month of October, as long as I can crank these videos out. I am editing on my phone and the space does not allow for like multiple videos to be made at once. But we have some fun stuff, so please subscribe. Be sure to like this video. It gives me a confidence boost every single time. And leave a comment down below. Have you read any of these books? Do you have any better underwater horror recommendations? Because I'm not saying that I'll never read water-themed horror again, but I think that this was maybe just not a great start for me. Happy reading, everybody, and cheers!